Okay, well, Carl, let's start out with one of my absolute favorite topics of all time, public perception. So, in Pakistan, what is the public perception of Russia and the United States in relationship to their attitudes towards Pakistan? Um, I think that there's there's perception, A, of, upon the, when it comes to the United States, is that um, there's been always this connection with the U.S. because especially ever since the U.S. got involved in Afghanistan, there's been always this pressure on Pakistan because of its um, perceived uh, control over the Afghan Taliban, which I think is overstated many times in many people's eyes, at least in Pakistan. They always think that the U.S. Um, tries to have this blame game going at the beginning when it first got involved in Afghanistan. It was all praises to Pakistan because Pakistan gave it, you know, overflight access, which it provided, you know, till very recently and still has extended that, in fact, even after the U.S. withdrawal. Um, but then, you know, when things started going south in Afghanistan, then the blame game began against so Pakistan that, you know, hey, Pakistan was muddying the water, so to speak. Uh, that's the first part. Now, on the Russian part, I think that there was... I think there's less, I'll be very honest with you, I think there's less people who think a lot about Russia in Pakistan, which is unfortunate. But I think that's recently changed ever since Foreign Minister Lavrov's recent visit to the country. This was after nine years that we had a Russian official visit Pakistan. So I think it's back on the radar, right? I think there's an understanding, uh, especially with this newer Pakistani government of Imran Khan, of more multipolarity uh, and multi, you know, uh, polarity order, world order. Um, and so... There's an understanding that Russia is also, of course, an important player. I think we've always known that, but we just didn't know how exactly and what exactly we could do with our relations with the Russians to improve our own stances. So I think that that's slowly coming up, but I would say that the, the, the lack of awareness is still probably an issue amongst the general population. You just mentioned multipolarity. That is a very hot button word within Russia. So are your politicians starting to use the uh, terminology multipolarity, or should I say the multipolarity model, as it is a uh, model for international relations? Is that hot in Pakistan right now? All right. So yes, there is definitely an understanding on the part of the elite, uh, the political establishment, that we are in a multipolar world. And so that's why we're recalibrating our relations with many others around the world, such as the Russians, because we realize that we don't want to be in just one axis, so to speak. So we don't want to be in a U.S. axis. Uh, we have good relations with the Chinese now because of CPEC, uh, BRI, uh, et cetera. And so then the Russians sort of come along with that because we understand that China and Russia also have good relations um, and have mutual interests in many regards around the world. But I think it's it's a question of Pakistan finally then realizing that it needs to have independent policymaking as well. And that then that then means having your own national interest centered and then having good relations, even if you don't get along about every single issue around the world with others, including the Russians, Chinese, etc. Okay, let's go back to public perception. Now, the Cold War was a time of change for pretty much the entire world, but it was definitely years of change for Pakistan. I mean, there are still people alive today who lived during British India, but now both the British and the Indians, for you guys, are gone and are outside your borders. So, how did the Pakistanis view themselves during the context of this end of the colonial era, the whole Cold War thing? How did you view yourselves back then? Um, to be honest, I think the Russians, as in the USSR, if I may be more specific, the Soviet Union, had um, okay relations with Pakistan at certain points. So, for example, under the government of Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, the USSR helped us um, build our, our probably most important steel mill um, the Pakistan steel mill, which I believe now the Russians, in fact, during this trip of Lavrov, have agreed to actually update for us because there's there some issues that we're going through with that steel mill. And that's an extremely important industry for us, extremely important factor for us. So um, the Russians have had that influence over us even from the Soviet days, and that's been very vital. With the Americans, I think that there was there was that perception, as you know, about what happened with Afghanistan. And Afghanistan, I keep bringing that up because that's always been the prism uh, through which many of the uh, external countries have viewed Pakistan. We've always been used as important strategically because of the fact that we are a neighboring, like a neighboring country to Afghanistan, which I think is also unfortunate. I mean, we can talk about that later too, but I think that putting us just into that box is probably an unfortunate reality. We're more than just a neighbor of Afghanistan. Uh, so I think that the two countries sort of haggled over us, I wouldn't say is the right word, but as in we, we went back and forth because of the realities of what was happening in Afghanistan throughout these years. Uh, 
Um, and and like I said, I think that that's probably an unfair box to put us in. But nevertheless, that's I think what how, what influenced our relations with both sides. Okay, so what would the modern economic relationship between Russia and Pakistan look like? Is it a steel thing? Is it energy? Or did the 1990s pretty much kill every opportunity? No, so I mean, with this current trip of Foreign Minister Lavrov, and now just, in fact, over the past 24 hours, and 72 hours, in fact, I think there's been a, a deal which has been finalized, um, and it's been a long time coming. This was set in motion in 2015, which is a gas pipeline that the Russians are meant to help us build between the cities of Karachi, which is a southern port city in Pakistan, and Lahore, so where I'm sitting right now in Punjab province. Uh, so it won't just be serving Lahore, but it'll all be serving other cities, important areas within the Punjab province. The $2.25 billion project, the Russians will have, I think, and I know this is up for debate right now, but I think around a 26% stake once this project is done, and the Pakistanis will have around 74%. So nevertheless, I mean, the Russian know-how, the Russian infrastructure, the Russian construction will be helping us a lot in this regard, and that's huge for us. As I said, for, for you know, for countries that didn't even have you know, very high profile visits back and forth over the past nine years or so. This is really a, a, a significant leap forward in our relations in that regard. And as I mentioned, uh, the steel mill probably being updated fairly soon is on the cards. And there is military, there are military equipment sales that are set to happen fairly soon. At this point, I mean, I look for details. I didn't find any. It's unspecified right now, but there was talk of that during the Lavrov trip. And then there is a few military drills coming up as well fairly soon uh, in which the Pakistanis will be taking part along with the Russians. Okay, so firstly, Wakar, I have to beg your forgiveness because I know my Cleveland accent does not exactly sound flattering when talking about countries like Afghanistan and Pakistan. Sorry. So, the Soviets and the Americans had conflicts in Afghanistan. The Americans have invaded Iraq twice. Uh, Iran is always under constant threat. Syria is in flames to this day. So it's almost like you guys in Pakistan are on the very edge of the iron sights of American foreign policy. Does this positioning have any effect on politics in Pakistan? I mean, aren't you guys afraid of becoming next? I don't think we're afraid of becoming next, but I think that what this does is, as I said, it, it, it always makes us, um, in the eyes of the Americans at least, a conduit. We're just, we're, we're just, we're just, you know, we're, we're just there and we're just to be used as this passageway to get things done for them because of our strategic location. Uh, and we're seen less for our, you know, potentials domestically, uh, economically and otherwise, of course. So I think that that's unfortunate. But yes, I mean, um, the relations with Iran are, are challenging for us as well, because, as you know, there was a gas pipeline deal that just unfortunately didn't actually then work out from the Pakistani side because we were afraid of sanctions and those those sanctions threats were very, very real. As with, in, in fact, interestingly, even with this pipeline I mentioned before, the name was changed from, I think it was North-South Gas Pipeline to a very Pakistani name called the Pakistani Stream or Pakistan Stream Gas Pipeline. And that was, again, done to avoid U.S. sanctions. As you know, there's there was a U.S. sanctions threat even on Nord Stream 2. So the Americans are very touchy about energy as well around the world and where they can have influence. So I think that yes, um, beyond of course, just Iran, Afghanistan as I've already mentioned, we're in a tough neighborhood certainly, and we have a lot of people who try to control our policy making and some of them have been successful because of our economic situation, because of the fact that we've had challenges over the years politically as well, instability in that regard. So uh, there have been countries in the Middle East, for example, who have tried to take advantage of us, but I think that with this latest, more stable political situation, if I may use that phrase, we are then able to now start recalibrating, hopefully, uh, and become more balanced. And I don't know if the word is neutral, but just more balanced, uh, probably, in, in how we approach everybody. Now, who are these people that you mentioned that want to control Pakistani policy? And to what end? Uh, the goal is um, multifaceted, probably. So we... As I said, because we do have and we have had a lot of political instability and then by default then economic instability, as you know, that those two are always intertwined, uh, we've then had to export a lot of labor. So, the, so the, as we know, that a lot of those laborers and the money that they would send back or the remittances that would send back to the country became then a part of our economy because that was very vital. A lot of them were being able to you know, support families back here in Pakistan while working as a construction worker and or domestic 
a uh, servant of some sort to to a lot of these Persian Gulf uh, countries within these Persian Gulf countries. Uh, now, I think that because of that, then because these countries knew that we were in a dire economic situation, uh, you know that whenever whenever a country gives you a quote unquote gift of money, it's not without strings attached. You always have strings attached. You need a favor back from that country. So Pakistan was then always put in an awkward situation when the likes of the Saudis or somebody else within the Middle East would give them money to pay off a certain loan or debt to an international lender. That would again come with strings attached and that created a whole bunch of reverberations within the country. Um, and we can probably talk about it in great detail, but that then became the prison through which they saw us. And then they sought to try to control us. I think that we're slowly coming out of that now, because I think as, as we know, there are alliances are, are quickly changing around the world. And so I think even Pakistan is part of that, that change. As these alliances are changing before our eyes, how do the big players around the globe see you today? Well, the narrative always is that we are a bunch of terrorists <laughs> waiting to attack somebody. We're a bunch of extremists in some way. We are, I mean, as, and, you know, we are very patriarchal. We're very conservative, all of us. I mean, it's, it's this huge generalization of all Pakistanis. And, you know, Pakistanis, as in with any country around the world, any nation around the world, we are extremely diverse. So, um, yes, there are, we have our significant amount of people who are extremely conservative religiously as well, but we also have the opposite. We're extremely liberal, extremely Western leaning. Um, so we have that variety A. So I think there's always that nuance, which is missing when it comes to discussing Pakistan. And so I, I, it's very unfair. I think that when we have a lot of those international correspondents for international news agencies and international organizations based, for example, in Islamabad, and they, from their little bubbles in Islamabad, are able to then pass huge judgments on us, um, again, from their prism, right, from what they've been told by the respective organizations to keep going as far as the narrative goes. Now, on the other side, yes, Pakistanis are, as with anybody else around the world, we are worried about things like our economy getting by on a daily basis, you know. And other things that Pakistanis do worry about, yes, is Kashmir. I mean, you know, I, the government pushes that line as well. But many Pakistanis do care about the issue of Kashmir being unresolved still. And beyond that, I mean, there are significant issues within the country. Pakistanis have significant grievances with their, um, you know, political establishment. But again, all of that has to be viewed with a nuance, right? It has to be viewed with the context of what people are going through here. So, for example, energy needs, um, electricity is extremely important. It's gotten a lot better in these years, but it's still a significant issue where if you don't have electricity um, most of the day or a lot of the day, that that then hurts businesses, that hurts an investment climate, that hurts education. Um, all of the above is extremely important. We also need investment to be spread out throughout the country and not just in the urban centers. Again, not an issue which is unique to Pakistan, but I mean, these are these are sort of global issues in many ways, but they're also there is also this very domestic context. And these things are not unfortunately spoken of, um, sometimes even by domestic media properly, but international media certainly. So the question is, who should be investing in Pakistan? Are you talking about, you know, your local millionaires and billionaires, or are you speaking about big international corporations who pretty much only see value in big cities and uh, definitely don't see any value in local labor? Both of the above. So, I mean, um, we, we have, yes, issues with corruption. So we need that money to stay within the country. Uh, not just escape the country, where you're, if you're making millions off of the country, you don't just uh, escape with that money somewhere else, invest somewhere else, try to buy citizenship somewhere else. You know, uh, that's been an issue for a very, very long time in Pakistan. Uh, a, on the part of those who are the elite and the rich. And secondly, yes, B, we need, we need foreign investment, certainly, but we need that done on a basis, which I think this government has been better about. It's been better about signing deals with other countries, not on the basis of the fact that, hey, we have to agree about everything or that you're going to be our benefactor, but we're going to be equal partners in this regard. So or as equal as possible. So we'll, we'll, we'll use your know how, but we also want to benefit for the country because in the past we've had and many people would argue that we still have some deals in place where foreigners come in, they invest. Um, but then they only employ their own people from their own respective countries. So then you're not even giving employment to Pakistanis to a, to a very large extent, or you're only using us as laborers. So A, we're not getting the know-how, 
and B, the, the money that is being made technically, a lot of it is then leaving the country back to your own respective country. So, you know, it's just a bad deal for us uh, overall sometimes. Actually, this exact sort of thing happened in Russia. I mean, the 1990s were the era of the expat, where it seemed like every company was run by someone from England, France, or America. But with time, and with Putin, slowly but surely, they sort of forced the laws to be something whereas you have to sort of prove that you need a foreign person to take the place of a Russian job, and uh, basically, expat life here has gone dead. So is it really true, Wakar, that foreign companies refuse to use the locals in your own country to work for their companies? I mean, I, that's that's what I, I, again, I'm not an expert in business, but I will say that that's what I've heard. And that's what the talk is about a significant amount of projects. But uh, like I said, we now have the realization that this has happened in the past. And so I, I believe that there is a significant amount of clamp down on that sort of thing. There's 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 an urge to then renegotiate many of the terms of such deals. OK, so geopolitically to the West, Pakistan has a big hot zone of conflict. But to the East, it sort of has its own Cold War going on with India. So how do the actions of America and Russia affect India, which in turn affects you? Well, uh, both the Russians and the Americans have good relations with the Indians, and they have for, for many, many years. Uh, but at the same time, I think that under, especially the current Prime Minister Modi, I think that the, the Indian tilt has been more towards the Americans, if we're completely honest, especially during the Trump tenure, but even after that. And there are some very obvious reasons for that. I mean, admittedly, India is a much larger economy. It's a much larger population than we are, um, you know, several times over. And that's obviously a reality. And I think Pakistani is very much understand that even, you know, conversations I've had with Pakistani officials are that it's not that we're expecting the world to not have relations with India. It's just that, you know, we want more balanced relations with us as well. So that's one thing, actually, I mean, I believe that is, is a challenge, even in our relations with Russia, because Russia has, for example, on things like Article 370, when it came to the Kashmir region, um, at the time that the Indians abrogated that article, which had given autonomous status to that region, the Russians sort of said at that time that this is an internal Indian matter and we don't want to get involved in the Pakistan's I believe would not have been very happy about that, even though they probably didn't say so very much publicly. Uh, but in and of itself, I think that's fine. I mean, I don't think the Pakistanis are expecting all of our allies, friends, or those who have, we have partnerships with to agree with everything we want them to agree with. You know, it, it doesn't work like that. Global diplomacy doesn't work like that. So uh, there is this much more mature understanding than of global politics that, hey, we may not agree with the Russians when it comes to India, but that's fine. We can still work with them um, as long as, you know, they, they have balanced relations with us and we're able to have a mutually beneficial relationship. So why was the Trump period so fruitful for relations with India? I mean, what was so bad about Obama or Clinton or Bush or whoever? Trump, uh, as you know, I mean, he was a larger, he is a larger, I shouldn't say was, he is a larger than life figure. He's different from other American presidents. And he's, um, a lot of his views, I wouldn't say are exactly like Prime Minister Modi's. I mean, that's probably an unfair characterization. There are probably significant differences there if we look in the details. But it seemed that the two men had a lot in common. Uh, good and bad. I mean, you know, I don't want to look at Modi as just negative, but I mean, there's a lot there that we can pick on negative as well. So I think that there was sort of that commonality that the two men found. And uh, I hate to use the word right wing tilt, but I think that there is a conservative tilt uh, in some parts of these respective populations, so both American as well as Indian. Um, there is a bit of a tilt, and then that then means to an extent, and I mean, I'm not saying that the left wing tilt is a good thing either, but I'm just saying that sometimes that then translates into um, much harsher than actions on the ground. So when I spoke about Kashmir, for example, the abrogation of Article 370 by the Indian government was seen as a very harsh move. It was seen as unprecedented. It is unprecedented, in fact, historically as well. And um, so I think that there was that commonality and a lot of the Indians like Donald Trump for the fact that um, he was at the beginning, at least when he first came to office, very critical of Pakistan. And this was before he realized that, oops, Pakistan is actually extremely important to the Americans for Afghanistan. And if you if you anger the Pakistanis, you're going to have a very hard time walking away a, from Afghanistan or having any form of influence over Afghanistan. So you really got to keep us happy, too, because we are we provide overflights. We provide passageway for American uh, supplies into Afghanistan. We are vital in that regard. And of course, we have a significant regional influence as well 
um, in that in those in those aspects. Well, one thing is, like Trump, if we were to say sit down and uh, draw out a plan for a Mount Rushmore of international leaders of the 21st century, conservative international leaders, we'd have to have Putin up there too. He is a very popular man within Russia and his popularity over and outside the borders, sometimes I think is even bigger. So how do Pakistanis perceive Putin? Um, I'll be honest, I think that the political elite probably debates Putin. And I think they're probably both those who are for, pro, and probably neutral when it comes to Putin. Uh, so I don't think it's actually, in Pakistan, I don't think it's actually about the man himself. I think it's probably what he represents, right? So for us, it is important, yes, that there is, um, and I'm looking at the entire Russian nation as a whole, not just Putin as one person, but the fact that, you know, Russia will stand up to the Americans, so to speak, I mean, you know, in quotation marks, stand up uh, when it comes to certain policies around the world. So, for example, um, I don't know, uh, on issues like Palestine, sometimes the Russians will be more balanced and or will speak up. Uh, against Israeli actions versus the Americans. Now, I know that's, a, that's, a, that's an example which doesn't affect us directly, but those things are important for many Pakistanis because we feel, again, the solidarity with, with Palestinians, etc. So those sorts of things do then unite us in many ways. And um, I think that Pakistan sees the advantage of the multipolarity I spoke about earlier and the fact that the Russians have a different perspective on things, that the Russians do not necessarily just, you know, toe the line when it comes to what Washington wants them to do. So I think there's, um, I don't know if respect is the right word, but probably maybe there is a certain amount of respect for Russia in that regard, because again, it is independent. Um, and like, because we find ourselves right now currently aligned with the Chinese because of CPEC, um, then that sort of by default means we're sort of aligned with the Russians as well, even though it's not like it's a package deal. It's just that, you know, we find ourselves having better relations for the reason that we are now um, good with the Chinese also. Okay, Wakar, how about a little bit of myth busting? There's this belief within Russia that one of the major problems they had as a society was when there was state atheism during communism. Uh, Muslim countries and more religious countries really couldn't respect the Soviet Union. And uh, for Russians, respect is very important. Uh, you'll hear about that a lot in this program. So the thing is, is now Russia is free. Russia has become very religious. It's probably the most Christian uh, country on the planet. So has that earned any sort of respect brownie points for returning to tradition, uh, having a very similar sort of view of how things should be done to uh, our uh, Muslim cousins to the south? Has that had any effect on anything at all? Or is that just some sort of weird philosophical nonsense coming from Moscow? Uh, I don't know that that influences that much of our, our, our view of Russia. Uh, there probably, yes, is an appreciation for the fact that, yeah, we do not have a, a communist, you know, government in place. And uh, yes, as you know, as you well know, that in, in the Muslim world, communism or the USSR and Soviet Union were seen with, with significant amounts of uh, mistrust at that time, at least. Um, I don't know that that factors a lot into um, our views of the country, because I think that we do understand that they're even with um, the current more, not more of a lean towards faith, if there is that, as you pointed out, then I think that there, there are still differences in that regard. We probably still have differences in how we view things. And I think that at this point, we realize that those aren't actually what's important for good relations, that it's sort of just we have to all be viewing things from our, our, you know, points of national interest, mutual national interest and mutual benefit.